Happy New Year. I can only say that once a year. I'm glad that we're all here. I'm sure none of us stayed up until midnight to uh, see the changeover of the, the year, but... Uh, Sorry, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> unless we were woken up. I can't. I have not been able to do that for a number of years now. But anyway, this morning we are still on the same series that we've been on for over a year now, a year and a half even. I think we started this back in July of 21. I got to think back now. Uh, But still, um, it's quite the topic to be talking about with how we behave in Christ. Um, The verse that's triggered this whole thing is 1 Timothy chapter 1. And I'll encourage you to follow along as we go through the message this morning. And bear with me as I'm still getting rid of whatever this thing that I've been afflicted with for three weeks now. Or maybe it's two different ones back to back. Who knows? But uh, we'll begin in 1 Timothy chapter 1. But before we get there, I'll open us in another word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you again for bringing us here this morning. It is a truly a joy uh, to have fellowship with the saints. I am thankful every time we're able to gather together and encourage and edify one another to, to make the most of this life. As you say, to redeem the time for these days are evil. All our prayers are about some form of evil that's going on in this world. And I'm thankful that you care and hear about all of it. I'm thankful you know everything, too. And I'm thankful we get to talk right directly to you. Thank you for that privilege that you brought for us through Jesus Christ, uh, that we can have this relationship freely and everywhere, uh, praying without ceasing. Lord, my prayer this morning is you guide the message, uh, the words that I will speak, uh, knowing that I am not perfect, but I'm thankful, Lord, that you can encourage and edify all of us and and bring us closer in a relationship to you through the study and discussion of your word. So may you be honored and glorified this morning and forever. In Christ's name, amen. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, just to get that little bit of context there. Paul writes and says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. <clears throat> this verse has triggered a lot of discussion, at least a lot of burdens upon my mind, heart and mind, I suppose, to talk about doing things ignorantly in unbelief. Because as we've said many times before already, since I don't know how many weeks we've been on this verse, Paul knew the Scriptures He knew a whole bunch of scripture, and yet he was persecuting believers because of his obstinance of apparently the righteousness of the works of the law, whatever we want to put it, but he did it in unbelief. He did not believe Jesus was the Messiah, and so he persecuted that way, as it's put in scripture, uh, to the uttermost. He was going to the extreme. He was the one that held the coats of those that stoned Stephen. In Acts 7, it was he cast his vote against Stephen, uh, giving his voice against it. So he was very much against Jesus Christ until he met him on that road to Damascus. But talking about this doing things ignorantly in unbelief, it just it triggers in my mind such a desire and a zeal to encourage maturity in Christ, to encourage reading the scriptures, to to pray to God about what His Word says, because He is the author. And I was caught up in this too at the beginning of my spiritual life, uh, asking the questions, some question like this, what book can I read to get to know more about the Bible? And, And you all laugh, and rightly so. I have heard that question so many times. What book can I read? What did someone write? Where can I go to learn more about the Bible? And now today, of course, I just jokingly say, the Bible. (laughs) You can read this because he wrote it and he knows what's in it. (laughs) Uh, But jokes aside, people are struggling. And we go through this world, actually the indoctrination of much of the world is you've got to read something written by some expert. 
But if we're honest with each other, nobody's an expert in anything. We learn as we go. We get wisdom as we go. But there's just so much in this world, so much complexity that only God knows it. And that, especially when they disagree. Yeah. Oh, we're going to get into that this morning, too. Because uh, Romans 14 has been on my mind and heart to get to for probably like three weeks now. But Romans 14 is just its so full of information that mature Christians and even immature Christians need to pay attention to. And even though I say I want to get there, we're probably not going to get there for like 30 minutes. Because <clears throat> uh, what we've talked about... <laughs> Like, how, how is he going to manage that? Well, i got to go over the things that we've talked about in the previous weeks because of this last, it's the last verse. we got to make it last, right? It's got to be the epic finish to this whole series. Anyway, I, activity, what we do, our works in the flesh are really important. I can't stress that enough. We are not saved at all from sin, death, and wrath by anything we say or do. However, that's by faith alone and what Christ did alone. That's it. But our works and what we do is, are, really important. It's a part of our witness to the world that Christ is real. Christ is in us. It's that hope of glory. We've got to live it out if people are going to see the difference of what it means to be in Christ. Make it desirous that they should want it too, right? That's our part of our witness. It's not our job to save people. It's our job to share the gospel. And the vocation wherewith we have been called is to share that message of reconciliation. And I do thank God pretty much every day that he says it's by the foolishness of preaching it pleased him to save those that believe. Because <laughs> if it was by the perfection or the charismatic speeches, we'd be in a lot of trouble. Anyway, <clears throat> we've been exploring how we ought to live in Christ and what motivates us to live as God desires us to live. There's two main motivational factors, but first and foremost, we need to place God's word where it ought to be, and that is the absolute authority. If we start putting anything else in authority over God's word, like we started off today speaking, like what book can I go read? What expert can I talk about? What biblical scholar should I be following? I'll never call myself a scholar. I'm always going to be a Bible student because I'm always studying and learning. Okay? And, and that, I think, is a good attitude to have when we do uh, study our Bibles or go through our Bibles. <clears throat> but um, we, we need to place His Word as the absolute authority. If God says it, that's the way it is. Okay? And if He doesn't say it, then don't worry about it. <laughs> it's not important enough for God to give us in His book. It's, we don't need to... Do what Romans 14 says and start fighting each other over frivolous things. And that's the main reason I wanted to get to that. <clears throat> but it takes effort. It, this doesn't just happen. Maturation doesn't just happen. We have to make a conscious effort to learn who we are in Christ, learn who God is, how he revealed himself to us through his word and through creation. Right From the creation of the world, the invisible attributes of him are clearly seen. We can see the complexity and yet synergy in his creation all around us every day. And it is a beautiful thing to behold. We're about to get into the, well, I guess winter did sort of just start two weeks ago. I always just think that once you get to the new year, hey, spring's on its way, which is totally false. <laughs> but we're going to come into spring eventually where new life flourishes everywhere. That's one of my favorite times of the year, personally, because of all the new colors and the new life and everything just seems to be brand new, right? And so, anyway, I'll get off that soapbox for a moment. But it takes effort to take every thought captive to the captivity of Christ, right? We ought to change ourselves from worldly living, put off that old man, put on the new. We should desire to walk unto all pleasing, like it says Colossians 1.9, being fruitful in every good work toward God. Hey, that's the goal, but the only way it gets there is by, by filling ourselves with wisdom. And the only wisdom, true wisdom there is, is the Word of God. Knowing God's will, we've been over this many times before, is a great starting point. And it's that three-point sermon that I'll probably never give. <laughs> because God's will is more than threefold, but it's easy for me to remember these three things. God's will is that you're saved, number one. You've got to trust that he gave you Jesus Christ to save you from your sins. That's it. Have faith in his work through Christ, his blood paid for your sins, 
You're in Christ. In that one moment of faith. <clears throat> Thank you, God, he made it that simple. That's the gospel. He redeemed, reconciled the world unto himself in that work. So he wants you saved, then he wants you to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Both of these are found in 1 Timothy 2.4. And to me, that's a father to a child saying, okay, it's time to grow up. Right? Now you know, now you're, you're, you've got that basis, right? The milk of the word. You know what the, the gospel is, the saving gospel. Now it's time to grow up. It's time to mature. So come unto the knowledge of the truth. What is truth? That quote I like to quote, because Pilate asked that same question, except he walked the other direction because the truth was standing right in front of him. What is truth? It's the word of God. Right, John 17, 17, that's the easy one for me to remember because the chapter and verse are the same. Jesus simply says, thy word is truth, speaking to God the Father. So be saved, know the truth, and then act like it. Behave like you should in Christ Jesus, 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. How to possess this vessel in sanctification. It's a lot more poetic in the King James Version, but basically it's act like you should in Christ Jesus, now that you are saved and you know who you are in Christ. So all of those things are the will of God, and our actions and our, what we should be doing is, is summarily in one verse, and that is love your neighbor as yourself. I could have ended this series weeks ago, but saying that and living it are two very different things. Amen. And the more we talk about it and discuss how to love our neighbor as ourself, it becomes more natural. And so we're going to be spending, I'm guessing, at least two more weeks because i got to get through all of Romans 14. And at this rate, I'm not sure I'll get there even this morning. <clears throat> but we need to make that conscious choice to follow God, obey God in everything. Whether we're at our home, at work, going out shopping, it doesn't matter. Whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as unto the Lord. Colossians 3, right? 3.23. I'll probably quote that one again later this morning. I reminded us of the, the two, okay, so the two mo main, main motivational factors, or moaned, I don't know what I was trying to say there, main motivational factors, the fear of the Lord, because all of us will appear before the judgment seat of Christ, and that's not a judgment of sin, that's already taken care of by your faith, where you put your faith in Christ or not in Christ. But those that have put their faith in Christ, we will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, and it's entirely about works. How did we use this vessel in sanctification? So we studied 1 Corinthians 3 and 4, 2 Corinthians 5, and it talks about that judgment seat of Christ. Romans 14 does also. So it's a reality that, it's not, that we are going to get raptured away and stand before the God of all creation and tell him why we did what we did. That's intimidating. Right? So that's one side of motivation to, that's going to happen. I'm going to appear before him. But never forget what it says, 1 Corinthians 4, 5. Then shall every man have praise of God. Okay, so it's, it's intimidating, yes, but it's a joyful thing because all those things done in faith are going to survive that fire right, of the judgment seat of Christ. And we'll have our reward in heaven. We're still going to be in heaven in the presence of God forever. That's awesome. And, and having that's the other motivational factor, the love of God through Christ Jesus, where he gave us all those things. All right, 2 Corinthians 5, is it 14? The love of Christ constraineth us. That where we consider that uh, all were dead, right? That he died for, for all of us, <clears throat> that we were all dead and needed that resurrection, that new life that comes only in Christ Jesus. So those are the two motivational fact factors, that, that kind of fear, intimidation, reverence of God for the Bema seat, but also the love of God through Jesus Christ should motivate us to redeem the time for these days are evil, like it says in Ephesians 5. So we started off with that summary verse, love your neighbor as yourself. Well, what does love look like? And I took us through Romans 12, just to be different. I could have also gone through 1 Corinthians 13, that where God defines what love is. And it's amazing to me in Romans 12, the first thing that he says is love is without dissimulation. It's not hypocritical. It's just real truth all the time. Just like it says in 1 Corinthians 13, love rejoices in truth. And I'm, not, I'm tempted to go through all of Romans 12 again, but he goes through Romans 12 and defines what love is and comes down toward the end of Romans 12 uh, saying to repay evil with good. 
and let all the vengeance belong to God. He is the authority. And so that's, that brings me to the next point of we are not the authority over each other. We are like brothers and sisters all in the same family, all members of the one body of Christ. And as such, we shouldn't take our Bibles and start beating each other over the head with it, which is what we're tempted to do in the flesh. And I know and I say this with a smile on the face because I've done it before and I wish I never did. <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about for those that may be acting wayward in Christ. They are confessing Jesus as their uh, Savior and they, they say he is Lord and, and all of that. And yet we start squabbling and fighting, or as I like to say, have intense fellowship over some <laughs> topics, uh, it, it, whether they are biblical or not. But uh, we'll get to that in a moment. So God does say, vengeance is mine, I will repay here in Romans 12, quoting Deuteronomy 32. But always remember that God will render to every man according to his deeds. That said throughout the Bible, Romans 2.6 if you want one particular reference, but it's said in many, many places. <clears throat> also, I remind myself often that Psalm 24, 1, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Right? He knows where everything is. He knows who the heart of every man. He's going to sort out any situation. Okay? So God can do that. We cannot. <laughs> we're just not God. Uh, but whatever situation we're going through, because there are some very difficult situations that were even brought up just this morning, be fervent in prayer. Pray without ceasing, like it says. Bring all your supplications, can't say that word, supplications with thanksgiving before God. I'm blanking on Philippians 4 now, but bring them before him. Because as we studied in Revelation, all the prayers of the saints go up to his very presence himself. And, and he, he wants that relationship with us. He spared nothing. He gave us his own son, his own self came into this world to die for us. So how shall he not freely give us all things? He wants that relationship with us. I'm quoting and paraphrasing Romans 8. So as we go through life, and this is the main topic of this morning, we're going to encounter different levels of maturity in Christ. And as we encounter those different levels of maturity, we need to remind ourselves that we're not the authority over each other, but rather, like the brother and sister should, remind each other what the authority does say and let the authority deal with it. Not sure about you, but I'm remembering a lot of times when my parents had to tell me some things like this and how I have to talk about this with my, par my children as well. You're not the authority over each other. You don't have to take vengeance into your own hand and do what nat kids naturally do, right? <laughs> But I have to remind them, let the authority deal with it, and which happens to be you know, the parents in this case, but it's a picture of the body of Christ acting together. We're supposed to be one unit, unity. That's what God desires. Uh, our attitude is found in Philippians 2. We've been over that before, how that we should always be serving, have that attitude of serving, humbling ourselves, serving others, putting others before ourselves. Presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice, like Romans 12 says. <clears throat> okay, I just totally lost my train of thought. But coming back to Romans 13, so having this idea, this mentality of always serving others. How can I help them? How can I come along beside them and bring them into maturity? I think that was the idea of where I was going with that. And then we had to remind us of uh, the reality of legal authority. Romans 13, a very controversial <laughs> chapter to go over, but he does say to obey those that are in legal authority. I referenced John 19, where Pilate, again, before Christ, I don't even say Christ before Pilate, I guess you could make that argument, but Christ, in my mind, is authoritative over him. And Pilate said at some, in John 19, don't you know that I have the power? to crucify you, set you free, or something like that. And Christ says, you wouldn't have any power unless it was given you from above. And that, to me, is a very powerful statement. And it agrees, of course, with God's word here, Romans 13, 1, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. So we should pray for them also that are in authority, 1 Timothy 2. This is what we should do, no matter what we think about them. <laughs> All political jokes aside, no matter what we think about them, we should pray for them because Christ died for them too. 
Okay? And every time I remind myself of that, that just kind of takes all the political jokes and kind of throws them away. As Christ died for them too. I don't know if they're going to come to a saving knowledge of Christ before they're out of office and, and do some something good for God in office. That could happen. God saved Saul on the road to Damascus, right? Who was killing people. Yeah, I was going to try to quote, uh, I already turned away from 1 Timothy, but who was injurious and a blasphemer and, and just doing whatever he can, wreaking havoc to the church. He got saved. Anybody could be saved. God reconciled the world unto himself. So we may not agree with them. We may not like them. But God says to obey the laws of the land, to have a clear conscience. So that's what we ought to do. And it's another one of those easier said than done sort of things. But we should do it for conscience sake. <clears throat> if they're advocating something ungodly, though, we have to draw that line in the sand because they're, the ultimate authority is God. And we ought to obey God. And so we had to talk about the so-called Respect for Marriage Act that was passed recently. I forget exactly when. So I think just before Christmas, which essentially repeals the Defense of Marriage Act that was passed Clinton administration, I think, somewhere in the 90s. But supposedly, I remember reading that religious exemptions are going to be retained in this so-called Respect for Marriage Act, but it's anything but Respect for Marriage because it's anything goes. Whoever wants to be united can be, and it doesn't matter what the states think about it. It's federally, re federally recognized. That's essentially what I got out of it. I try to stay out of politics, to be honest, so if anyone wants to share more information, that's okay. But uh, in my mind, anything beyond one man, one woman in a marriage is disobeying God. That's how God defines it, and that's how we ought to behave. Amen. And then I had to bring up uh, Amy Grant, who happens to be a well-known Christian artist, who it's between her and God, whether she is truly in Christ or not, but she is quite friendly with the LGBTQ plus whatever community and was hosting her niece's same sex wedding, quoting to say, it doesn't matter how we behave, which is completely false. And I gotta call it out where I hear it. Uh, it does matter quite a bit how we behave because what she's doing is condoning the behavior and says, you can do that. And quite honestly, in Christ, you could do that if you've trusted sincerely that Christ is your savior, but the Holy Ghost is gonna be like, Stop it constantly. It's going to be in your mind uh, doing that. And you have to make the conscious effort to quench that spirit every day. And that's going to be really hard to do. And it doesn't matter which sin it is. If you're in Christ, it could be homosexual behavior, which very clearly from God's word is a sin. We read 1 Corinthians 6, which talks about um, homosexuality. It, 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 the Greek word literally says man bed. Okay, but it's talking about homosexuality there. <clears throat> and it, and it's, it's part of the list that cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And so when God says these are the sinful acts that make it just that they cannot enter into the kingdom of God, that, those are things that we should not be doing. Behavior does, in fact, matter. But people get caught up in the homosexual topic or the same-sex wedding or some su such like that. But really, we could get caught up in being disobedient to parents too because that one is called out as being worthy of death in Romans 1. Or we could talk about gossiping. Uh-oh. <laughs> We're all guilty of that one, I think. But uh, backbiting, all of that stuff is worthy of death. We shouldn't do it. What does God instead say in... Uh, Ephesians 4, so let no evil communication come out of your mouth except that which is to the use of edifying, that you may minister grace unto your hearers. That's what we should be doing. No backbiting, no gossiping, all of that. Boy, that flesh, though, that is going to... we we got to quench the flesh. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Maybe put it that way. But we we got down through Romans 13. i got to try to do more of a brief recap. I'm not good at that. I do apologize. I wrote, we got through more in Romans 13 in verse 9 where he says for this thou shalt not commit adultery thou shalt not kill thou shalt not steal thou shalt not bear false witness thou shalt not covet and if there be any other commandment I love those catch-all verses if there be any other commandment it is briefly comprehended in the saying namely thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself love worketh no ill to his neighbor therefore love is the fulfilling of the law 
So ultimately, we should love as Jesus, as God loved us through Jesus Christ, which I know is easier said than done. Uh, but what that doesn't mean is that we let anything go. We just back off from the fight. We have to stand for what's right because the loving thing to do is to make sure it's known what's right and wrong. Because maybe they don't know. Right? And dealing with young children, I know for a fact they don't know this particular thing yet, and I have to explain to them what is right and what is wrong. Because they just don't know. And maybe someone went through life a long time. It doesn't matter how old they are. Maybe they don't know. And we need to come alongside them and encourage them to do what's right because the loving thing to do is to be to prevent them from harmful bad behavior because bad behavior inevitably leads to hurting somehow whether physically or emotionally <clears throat> and then we finish Romans 13 I am gonna make it today good we finish Romans 13 in verse 11 where it says that now knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is salvation, our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. Powerful verses. And you think about when he wrote that, 2,000 years ago ish, knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for our salvation is nearer than when we believed. It, when he wrote that, there was still 4,000 years of Earth's history. So think about that, too, how it came up to him when he's, when he's saying the night is far spent. They were walking all that time without the full revelation of God. But through Paul, he received it. It filled up full the word of God. Now we have a complete word. We have everything we need to know this side of heaven. It's the day is at hand. We're almost done. We're at the, the we're about to cross that finishing line, finish line, right? We're so close to that. So let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly uh, as in the day, contrasting to the night. All those things are, are things that people do typically at night. The rioting, drunkenness, the uh, chambering, which is like sexual immorality or wantonness, sensual pleasure, not in strife and envying. So all that stuff is stuff of the flesh. We shouldn't be involved in any of that, but instead put on the armor of light. And you can read about the armor of God, Ephesians 6. Uh, but that's what we should have, that light, which makes manifest, it reveals things of darkness. Right? It, it, it exposes those, those things of darkness. So put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, make not provision for the flesh, to lust, fulfill the lusts thereof. Knowing Christ could appear in heaven and call the body of Christ home at any time should be an excellent motivational factor for us to make the most of every day. Because it could be today. And we don't know if it's that rapture event that's going to take us away or, sadly enough, car crash. Or something, anything like that could all of a sudden just happen. We don't know when our last day is going to be. I'll just put it that way. So we ought to make the most of every day. Getting here into Romans 14 then. So knowing all of this stuff in the book of Romans, which is quite full of information. We get to Romans 14 where it says, Him that is weak in the faith, receive you, but not to doubtful disputations. And I have to point out right away that this is a believer in Christ. Him that is weak in the faith, just starting off, understanding the gospel of grace at least and trusting in that, but maybe knowing nothing else. Right, we we got to remind ourselves that as a child in Christ, young in Christ, they don't know what the Bible says, and so they're probably going to do things that aren't according to the Bible. So we should not receive them to doubtful disputations. We're even commanded to receive these people, but not to doubtful disputations. What does that mean? It's basically nitpicking 
on everything or pointing out every little wrong or, or something like that. Uh, but if we go on here to verse 2, it says, For one believeth that he may eat all things. Another who is weak eateth herbs. So in other words, they don't believe they can eat all things. They think they can only eat herbs. This is an, an analogy. Uh, verse 3, it says, Let him, not him, that eateth despise him that eateth not. And let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God has received him. Okay? So we've got two different believers here. One thinks, the analogy here, one thinks that they can eat anything. One thinks they can eat only herbs, vegetables, or pulse. I like that word that the old English uses. I don't think anyone uses that anymore for vegetables these days. I can have some pulse today. Uh, that's in Daniel, by the way. <clears throat> but Because uh, he asked, can I not have the king's food? I just want pulse for 10 days. Anyway, you can read about that yourself. But the point is, here, uh, we can bring that around to today, okay? Someone thinks, I have to be vegan. I don't want to hurt any animals. It's just wrong, okay? Fine. Someone else thinks, I love my bacon. I'm not giving that up, <laughs> right? Again, totally fine. Uh, but to argue about that and to cause division over something like that, that's not good. That's an immature reaction. Uh, and that's exactly what it's saying there in verse 3. Let not him that despise him with eat it, which he eat not. Don't you know you can eat this delicious bacon? And it's okay. And the, you know, we can even quote this. Uh, First, First Timothy 4, 3 to 5 says, I can eat anything I want. It's sanctified by the word of God in prayer. Right? Like any, any creature, it's in the Bible. But this is the sort of thing like we can start just beating each other up with biblical verses because they can come back, I know wrongfully, and say, well, Levitical, Leviticus 11 says you can't eat pork, right? Which is a true statement. It's in there. But we're not under law. We're under grace, right? So there's, I know there's arguments that can go on about that, but people are convinced in their own minds about certain things. And rather than start punching and kicking or having that intense fellowship, like it's saying here, receiving to doubtful disputations instead of doing that, let's be calm and mature and state reasons why and, and that sort of thing about it. And perhaps someone thinks they are under that Levitical law. That's entirely possible. I've run into a whole lot of them. But then to explain to that, it's like, okay, you're right. It does say it there. And that's why Israel has this term of kosher. You know, and you can go into something like that and start explaining the Levitical law and how Christ eventually took that law, nailed it to his cross, took all those ordinances and everything out of the way. We are no longer under law, but under grace. So it could be an invitation to, uh, to talk about something like that. And I know I went over it in less than a minute. Sometimes it takes days, weeks, years to convince people we're not under the law, we're under grace. And that's just one example. Here's the problem, though, is this, I think, branches off into all sorts of things. <clears throat> it's not just about food like it is here through Romans, Romans 14. And you've perhaps heard of churches splitting over ridiculous things. The ones that I've known of personally are splitting over the carpet color. I wish I was wrong about these. Display screens for using Bible verses to, to, that are used in the messages or the teaching or something like that. Chairs versus pews. People split over this to go somewhere else. Wow. Right? I mean, you just think of, are we two? Like, why are we behaving this way? And, and thinking about, how does the outside world perceive that? So when Amy Grant says behavior doesn't matter, oh, yes, it does. Because when the outside world sees that, because inevitably that sort of gossip is going to get around into the community, hey, did you hear about such and such church that split over the chairs? <laughs> they don't like. I don't want anything to do with that church. But you just think about something like that. Like they're they're going to be turned away from going to hear the word of God, which is, I think, the main point. Yeah. Usually you're right. Usually at those kind of churches, they're not hearing the word, or they're hearing a couple verses here and there. And then this is what I did last week. There's too many of those kind of churches in the world. I I, I agree, but. Still, like the nitpicking on, on that sort of thing, it, it, it's just, no. <laughs> I can't really even think of a way to say it. It's just wrong. Uh, but it, it's about something that's not really doctrinal. 
Because sound doctrine is always emphasized in Scripture. We ought to stay on sound doctrine. If you read through Timothy, he's like, you've got to stay in the Word, read the Word, preach the Word. Right? So it's always about sound doctrine. But carpet color, that has nothing to do with our walk in Christ or who we are in Christ or anything like that or what thing we sit on. I don't care. <laughs> None of us should really care. I consider it a joy to be able to get together every week and to talk with each other about life's up and downs and to share the Word of God and encourage one another. That's why we come to church. I even had to ask my kids this morning, why do we go to church? And that's kind of, that's actually the answer they gave, is to be with each other and to get to know God better. But coming back to Romans 14, we need not get caught up in those little details. <clears throat> Remember who we're up against. Good <clears throat> grief. We're up against Satan and the spiritual darkness, the wickedness in heavenly places, the prince, the power of the air. 2 Corinthians 4, we've already looked at this one before. I wasn't going to go back and, and read it again. But Satan is busy blinding those uh, to the truth, bl blinding those that don't believe yet to the truth. He is hard at work keeping people from being saved, from coming to the knowledge of the truth, and behaving correctly, because that's what God wants. He's doing the exact opposite. So what is Satan trying to do? He's, trying to, he's going to try to cause division because a house divided cannot stand. We know that. And chaos and disorder. Like that's what Satan is going to be doing, and he's hard at work doing that. And that's what we're up against. So we need to maintain... Blanking on words this morning. That image? I don't think that's quite right. But we're, we're, we're to maintain the character of God, maybe I'll put it that way, in ourselves each and every day that people can see Christ in us and latch on to that hope of glory rather than be made some laughing stock over splitting over some frivolous thing. But then I got to talk about Christmas for a moment because this causes a huge division within Christians, within the body of Christ. <clears throat> Many will quote, you shouldn't celebrate Christmas, it's a pagan holiday. And they say that sort of thing, it stemmed from a pagan background and whatever. Okay, but again, I'm jumping ahead of myself. If you look at Romans 14, 14, he says, I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus Christ that there is nothing unclean of itself. An evergreen tree is not evil. If you put an evergreen tree in your house because it's always green, and to you that represents everlasting life, and praise the Lord, awesome. That's okay. That's a good thing. But if you think that evergreen tree is representing some sort of pagan ritual of some sort of whatever that they did there, I'm not going to get into that detail, and you don't have it in your house, okay. <laughs> Both of those things are okay because it's the conviction in their heart. The evergreen tree is not evil of itself. That's what that verse says, right? Nothing in this creation is evil of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean to him, it is unclean. And so we need not beat each other up about all of these things because it's between the heart and God. Do we do it? There's, mm. So this is the topic that I really want to get into, but I don't have enough time. Uh, this morning, so we're going to get into more of this again last week. <clears throat> but we also know from 1 Corinthians that all things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. Hey, we shouldn't. I know the, the thing that I always come up with or challenge with is, oh, so you're under grace and anything goes. Like, yes. So I can go out and commis, ma commit mass genocide and I'm still in Christ, I'm still going to heaven? Yeah, but why would you do that? God saved you from all of that nonsense, but that's usually the one that I get. But this sort of Christian, or I'm sorry, Christmas controversies is kind of the same thing. It's about the tree or the decorations or whatever else. I mean, if you hang up garland and you put up mistletoe because God made these things and they're beautiful or the holly and the ivy and you give thanks to God, awesome. That's between you and God. Give glory to God. But if for somehow that stuff's all offensive to you then and you don't do it, for God, okay, that's okay too. And we need not fight over each other for these things. <clears throat> what we should not do is spread some lie about an obese man breaking and entering into millions of homes every night and giving credit to him for giving gifts based on behavior. Okay, That's not good. 
that is a lie, okay? Mom and dad worked hard, kids, for those gifts, or grandma and grandpa, or whatever, to provide for those things, and we give thanks to God who provided. But the whole point of Christmas, and we made sure to emphasize this with our kids too, is the greatest gift ever given, and that is Jesus Christ. God came into this world, and that's why we celebrate Christmas. But again, that's between the heart and God. If someone celebrates Christmas because of the gifts, or because of Santa Claus, obviously that's not good. And they need to understand the gospel of the grace of God. But you think about it, that gift that was given can be celebrated any time of the year. And Romans 14 is going to get into that as well. Yeah, which I don't have time to get into this morning. But what I'm, the main point, again, what I'm trying to get at is we need not fight each other over such things. We can explain, biblically speaking, I would land on the side of you can celebrate Christmas however you want as long as it's done to Jesus Christ, to God. Now, if you want to put the decorations up, go ahead. If you don't want to put any decorations up, that's fine. But if no one puts any decorations up, the ones that do put decorations up shouldn't say, you Scrooge, <laughs> or anything like that, because that's just these doubtful disputations that just don't matter. We joke about that sort of thing, I know. But to actually be angry at someone for not celebrating Christmas, that's not necessary. Because verse 4 to... <clears throat> read verse 4 first. I'm going to get into the next few verses. Romans 14, verse 4. I don't know if I ever told you to turn there. Hopefully you're there. <laughs> Romans 14, verse 4. He says, Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. Now remember, the context here is between two believers. One is a mature believer, one is an immature believer. And the question, the rhetorical question here is, who are you to judge another man's servant? Are you God? It's a pretty powerful question. But if we're going to judge another man's servant, and it goes both ways, either the, the mature believer or the immature believer, based on verse 3. Right? Don't despise either one for doing what they're doing because they're going to stand before God for this thing, whatever that thing is. Right? So who are we to judge that? Because it's God that can hold him up. If you're going to try to bring him down because he's doing something for God, mm, that's not good. <laughs> right? That's another one of those intimidating things like, I'm going to have to answer to Christ for this behavior. It kind of freaks me out when I start thinking about that sort of thing. But it helps us to mature. And God knows as the perfect parent, as the perfect father in heaven, how we need to mature. And he's going to bring us through uh, events in our lives like this. <clears throat> but ultimately, again, we are not God. We don't pass the judgment. But as brothers and sisters, like con condemning judgment, I think, we, we still judge the behavior. Like what I just did with Amy Grant. That, what she said was not good. What she's doing is not biblical. And that's what I'm calling out. That is a judgment. But I'm not going to be the one that says, well, you've got to go to hell for that. That's not my job. She could very well be in Christ and just be completely ignorant of Scripture, like many Christian artists are. And sadly, many Christian preachers are. I don't have to get into that either. Where was I with all this? Okay, so God is going to be able to make him stand. God is going to have the ultimate say. God knows the heart and the action after the motivation. But verse 5 here, it says, One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks, and he that eateth not to the Lord he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. It doesn't matter. The food isn't evil, the day isn't evil, how we treat the day. And where our heart is, that's what matters. So whether you celebrate Christmas or not, whether you celebrate birthdays or not, some people make a big deal out of it. We like to. Other people think we're crazy. Whatever. <laughs> it doesn't really matter. Or whether you make a big deal of anniversaries of who knows what. I mean, wedding anniversaries probably should do that. Uh, but other anniversaries of such things, like my anniversary at work, I don't care. Some people might. Uh, I, you know, I don't know, but I, I'm more of the uh, mindset of treating practically every day alike because every day I treat as this is a gift that God gave me in this earthen vessel that I don't know how long I've got and I want to make the most of it. 
That's my mindset. You don't have to copy me. You can make the most of Christmas, make it the whole theatrical production, and give glory to God. Go for it. I love Christmas time with the kids. It's just it's a fun family time to get together. Some people don't. It's okay. Just according to Romans 14, that's okay. Verse, where did I leave off? Verse 7, 6, 7. It says, For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. Whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. Once we trust that Jesus Christ paid for our sins on the cross of Calvary, we cannot be separated from God through the love of Jesus Christ. That's Romans 8 in a nutshell. It, which is a great reality and truth to understand, but whether we live under the Lord or whether we die, we are going to be God's. And this verse reminds me an awful lot of Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me in the life which I now live in the flesh. I live under the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Ultimately, that should be our attitude. Right? As we mature in Christ, we realize the length and depth and breadth of what God did for us. And so we realize that Romans, well, exactly what Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, that, yeah, I really should use this body for God's glory all the time, every day. But Romans 14 is all about let's not cause division in the body of Christ. All of these things are non doctrinal issues. You want to celebrate a particular day because it means something to you? Go for it. Someone else that does it, President's Day? Anyone celebrate that one? Columbus Day? I mean, some people, maybe, I don't know. I don't. <laughs> but some people might make a big deal of that. But no matter what we're doing, verse 9, for to this end Christ both died and rose and revived that he might be both Lord both of the dead and the living. So it doesn't matter what we're doing. We ought to do it for God. And I think I'll just remind us one more time. I'm going to quote, read, actually, so I don't mess it up. Colossians 3. But we ought to act as brother and sisters in Christ Jesus, coming alongside one another, encouraging one another to that right path or to the, the right behavior of who we are in Christ if we see someone wayward or perhaps they need to learn sound doctrine so we can come alongside as a teacher but even teachers need to be taught we don't always those that are teaching don't know everything all right we need each other all the body of Christ needs each other <clears throat> But all of that being said, that whether we live unto the Lord or whether we die unto the Lord reminds me an awful lot of Colossians 3 as well. There's so many cross-references to that particular passage. Colossians 3.1 says, If ye then be risen with Christ, which is a given, because this letter is to saints in Christ. So if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on the things of the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Boy, I can hardly wait for that day. And then down in verse 23 where it says, And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily, as unto the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. Now, all these verses tie together. He is Lord of all. He is God. He is the one that can pass Judgment, as we read in uh, Romans 14, 4. To his own master, he stands or falls. So I just want to encourage us to be that, that brother and sister in Christ, to maintain unity. I'm tempted now to go through pretty much all of Philippians, because that's what that's about, too. They're having some issues there with unity. They're being divided of, we don't even know what, but Yodis and Syntyche, they needed to make up, didn't they? Uh, so, uh, but in that, in Philippians, you have that attitude of serving, putting others before the self, having the mind of Christ, which was to be obedient to the death of the cross. That when God, when Jesus, and I seem to bring this one up every week, but when Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, and how he prayed, Father, if it be possible, take this cup from me. And there was no answer. It was the only way that. God could redeem or reconcile the world unto himself. And Jesus was sweating, as it were, 
drops of blood. He was so distraught about it. Uh, but he was obedient, and he did everything according to the Scripture. An astronomical amount of Scriptures fulfilled in him. It's just amazing, to the point of, of the death of the cross and the resurrection. So, with that, <laughs> let's close in a word of prayer. Uh, Lord in heaven, thank you again for your words, your grace, your love, your example of how we ought to live. I'm thankful, God, that you don't leave us hanging, trying to figure out what does love look like, how do I love my neighbor as myself, but to think about those behaviors as we go through on a day-to-day -day basis and what we do like and what we don't, how we, I don't think anyone wants to be told every single wrong they do all the day long. Uh, but I'm thankful, God, that we're forgiven all things in Christ. We are complete in Christ. And we have forgiveness in Christ. We have that encouragement in Ephesians 4 in your word that we ought to forgive one another as you have forgiven us for Christ's sake, which is all things, everything, every day. While that's hard in the flesh, Lord, I'm thankful you give us the strength to put off the old man and put on the new. I'm thankful you give us the, the spirit, not of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind that we can navigate through the difficulty of this life, eagerly awaiting your call to bring us home. So may you strengthen our walk, Lord, every day and continue to help us to stand boldly on the firm foundation of Jesus Christ, sharing the message of reconciliation every single day, whatever form that may take. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.